Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. <laughs> Welcome to this wonderful edition of the Timbuktu Report. My, we have a lot of guests tonight. Dr. Rick Stevenson, my weekly guest, who is a professor at the University of Florida, and he is also a man of the cloth. And every week we ask him to take us to God in prayer before we get started. We're going to get right into it, Dr. Stevenson, because we have so much to cover. We have two wonderful couples who've joined us, and I'm really excited about it. So if you would, just bow your heads and let us go to God. God, thank you. Amen. Go. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share. We just pray for your presence tonight. We bless you for this uh, mode of communication in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 On the Timbuktu Report, this show was started because of a desire to educate, inform, and inspire those who watch us on a weekly basis to talk about the history of the United States of America, but not just the history of the United States of America, but um, the history that we have not heard about from Timbuktu to the United States. So, We've talked about the things that have happened in um, that have been happening in the news uh, as it relates to all of the stuff that's been happening over the last four years and the cherry on the top, uh, the January 6th event, the presidential election. We invited, we talked about this last week, Dr. Stevenson, to invite uh, some biracial families to be on this show to talk about um, their journey as couples, as families in the United States of America, where there's the rhetoric that we want to return America to its greatness when it was illegal for these families to be together. Right. Um, our guest tonight from Jackson, Tennessee, uh, Hardy Marshall and his wife, Christy, and then from South Carolina, Natasha Brown and Robert Tasha, maybe Robert will have to come and be on camera with you or you guys share the same one. Can you do that, Tasha? Tasha, Tasha. Okay, I'll let him know. Obviously, she's in. Okay, thank you. Thank Can you. you. Hear me? Christine Hardy, thank you very yes. much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, never mind. I see Robert down here. I'm getting ready to bring him in. There he goes. There's Robert. Hey, Robert, operator era. No worries. I should you come back on. So listen, um, I have not talked to you all um, collectively as a group. So first, let me just say thank you for being a part of this show, for being willing to share with our audience this very, very uh, personal and private journey that you all have been on as friends, as husband and wives, as parents. So Thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, You're welcome. I, yeah, let me just ask you, because Dr. Stevenson and I have uh, had lots of conversations about where we are in the United States of America and where we're not. Did it surprise you all to find out that in prior to the Supreme Court ruling in 1967, you all would have been arrested? You could keep police could have come to your house, arrested you and taken you to jail just because of who you decided to love. Right. Uh, I would say it didn't surprise me knowing that in 2021 that we're still having firsts in America. Uh, for example, uh, today we had the, the very first um, ACC baseball umpire crew take the field uh, at the University of North Carolina together as one crew for the very first time. So in 2021, we're still making uh, those type of historic type of things that and it, that should at this point be ordinary. So I, I'm not shocked that that was true in the 60s. What about I have to say, Go ahead. I have to say I was surprised that it was as late as 1967. I would have guessed surely it had to have been years before that. So yes, I'm very surprised that 1967 was a year that it was finally amended, if you would. And that ruling was based on a couple in Virginia who did get arrested. Right. And were Wow. Go ahead. 
I, I just I'm shocked. Um, I said, "Wow!" I was um, <laughs> that that seems so primitive. Yeah, yeah. Th there were some states uh, as early as 1874 that repealed the miscegenation law, but for the most part, it was a felony for interracial marriages, especially um, <clears throat> in your southern states. And what's interesting to me is miscegenation is it actually comes from two different words one mesa which means to mix and genus which means uh, uh, family or, or gene pool when you have these laws in the south that were constructed by white men and yet a significant portion of the sexual abuse of black women was by white men so this such this level of hip hypocrisy that yes. went into these laws, right? But with another aspect to it, I don't want to take too much of it. In 1740, they changed the laws uh, of how a child was determined to be socialized. And up until 1740, a child took on the social status of the father. But because so many slave babies were being born by black men, they changed the laws so that the child took on the social status of the mother. So if the mother was a slave, the child was free. I mean, a slave. And if the mother was free, the child would be free. So it gave the fathers the opportunity to mess around if they wanted to and still have the children's property. Never when, heard that before. And I think that there are so many things that we take for granted. I mean, when you all met each other, there was never any, well, I won't speak. What were your thoughts about introducing your significant others to your families? Who had trepidations about that? Nobody? I didn't. I didn't uh, because he, he was friends with uh, my family. So I met him through my family. So they already knew him. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So <laughs> they already. <clears throat> well, that has its pros and cons too, though. <laughs> and I didn't because there were, I have an uncle, I have first cousins who are mixed, who are my age. So I have an uncle who obviously married his white wife uh, in the 1950s. Mm. So it was, I, I didn't give a lot of, I didn't give a second thought to it. Right. <clears throat> I didn't have to think twice, but I already knew that there would be some in my family that would likely take exception to it. Mm -hmm. But I had already had an experience of having a very close friend who happened to be a black male. And I had dealt with some of the looks and obvious perception just from being around him. Mm -hmm. um, so I already I had already had some of the experience of being looked at differently because of who I chose to associate with. Mm -hmm. But I, I wasn't concerned with even family members having that issue because I did view it as their issue and not mine. I wasn't going to let somebody else's opinion dictate what I did. So there was yeah. one couple that, go situation. ahead, Robert. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I had the same uh, situation as uh, Kathy did. Um, I had, we kind of had a melting pot where I grew up. So the race thing wasn't as, uh, as predominant um, in that area, at least in that area where I grew up, it was, it was multiracial mixed everywhere from any from the time I was a child on up. So, uh, but but just like I, I'm sure there was folks in my family that this they probably have not spoken up about not being supported or not. Um, but nothing nothing out like in public. So we, I wouldn't know that at this time. One couple that wanted to be on the show but had a scheduling conflict. He's African American and she's Jewish. She said to me, "I initially led a lesbian lifestyle." my family was more upset about me marrying somebody black than me living the life as a lesbian. Wow. 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 Okay, that's, wow. As, as we look at, as you're watching this, and both of you have children, uh, Christy, you and Hardy have four children together um, and two other children. And Tasha, you and Robert have two children. As you all looked at what was taking place on January 6th, how, how do you all discuss that with your children? 
and helping them to understand what they may encounter. And Hardy, your children are older and playing sports. Right. Uh, my 19 year old understands very well because he's experienced so much through school and church and friends and the discussion with him was more, he was not especially surprised. The younger ones, unfortunately, have experience through school and sports also. And it, it's <clears throat> what I always tell them is you will always encounter people who have different beliefs and who will not treat you necessarily fairly because of the color of your skin. I said, that, that's unfortunately how things are. That's what you can expect. So it's not fair, but understand that's often what you're going to be faced with. Christy and Robert, you all are white. You have children that are considered African-American children. When they're looking to you for answers, what, what do you say to them? Uh, I, I would say we, have, um, we haven't got to that age where it's become a huge uh, question or, or anything. Uh, um, and, and I, I think truth be told, because Natasha does a good job, uh, um, you know, celebrating her culture and, and, and bringing us into that of, um, environment. And, and I will say, um, being military and military, and, and obviously, you know, the term they're military brats, um, they, they have experienced all different races as well, like I did as they come up. Um, and so I, I think for, for them, um, it's just, in, it, she, I, I just give credit to where it's due. I mean, Natasha does a great job on making sure that they, that they learn both um, you know, their culture and who they are and uh, both sides of that, um, of that question. Uh, as far as like, the January 6th thing, I think what it's unique for us to have that discussion because, uh, um, you know, my profession, you know, it doesn't matter who, who I may or may not um, vote for. I, I, I have sworn an allegiance to defend and support the Constitution regardless of that. And so, like, that, that person in office is my commander in chief. And so whether I agree or disagree at the end of the day, that, that that's kind of the... Um, so I do, I do exercise my right to vote and we do discuss that but after that vote is over um, with any of them, any of the four presidents that I've served under, that's, that's kind of the, it's done what it's done for me. And so we have to kind of walk that line of the, the obligations that I, I have and then and also my personal uh, belief systems. Gotcha. Chrissy? I think our family has enough ongoing conversation about the way people look at someone, the way you're perceived and what their perceptions tend to be based on. And it's not necessarily something you've said or done. Your intelligence, your abilities, they understand even at their ages currently that somebody's perception and their personal views shape what they think they see in you. And so um, we try to give them a biblical foundation and they have, they're surrounded by, the Marshall family's just wonderful. I, I, can't, I can't say enough about the Marshall family. So they're I blessed agree. to be part of a very, very strong family system. And they know that they have that support and backup from their family first. Um, but I think, I think we have enough ongoing conversation so that even seeing things like that in the news, unfortunately, it's not a surprise to any of them. But it can be hard having these conversations with children who still have the viewpoint of, I don't understand this. Why do people think this way? Why do people see things like this or not see things that I see? So it, it, it can be difficult having those conversations. But I, I thank God that Hardy and his family, especially since they're all right here around them, um, they give them very biblically grounded but very, very realistic answers and they speak, they, all of our children will speak candidly about their perception of current events. So there's still a percentage, I think it's um, 
as, as one woman said to me once, I believe the races ought to stay with each other. And one of the arguments during the time of the Supreme Court ruling was that if God had intended for the races to mix, then he would not have given different colors. <laughs> Dr. Stevenson, from a historic perspective, race was not an issue. In color was not an issue and is still not an issue in many parts of the world because we now hear about white Hispanics because mm -hmm. not every Hispanic is brown or darker skin tone. Right. Some of them are look white. And so right. we hear the term in the news today in reference to people who are involved in things is to say a white Hispanic. So Dr. Stevenson talk about this whole dynamics of how the United States of America evolved and used skin tone as a divisive tool. So um, race is actually what we call a social construct. And it was actually uh, created to justify slavery. And it was an instrument that was used primarily from slaveholders and merchants to justify uh, not only getting money from uh, Europe, from England, from Spain, Portuguese, but also to justify this notion of inferiority based on skin color. And uh, the science brought into it, the script they brought it, the, the theologians brought into it. As a matter of fact, you may have even heard of this so-called curse of Ham, uh, who was one of uh, Noah's grandsons. Noah. And, and, and the argument was that Ham was cursed to be black, when in fact, if you really read the scriptures, it was Canaan who was cursed. It wasn't Ham. And the curse had nothing to do with skin color. The curse had to do with the deprivation of the land. But, you know, you have to understand that so many of the uh, literary documents that were written between the 1600s and 1800s were written by Europeans. And so they wrote these documents to justify uh, their, their argument to enslave these Africans and people of color um, for their own economic means. And then the other aspect of that is when we when we look at the scriptures and i appreciate the fact that you you mentioned several occasions christy the role of the bible uh if I, and i was talking about this in a class i teach a class called uh race religion and rebellion and i was arguing that one of the problems when it comes even to theology and black liberation theology and theology in general is that so many people use the text to support various agendas that have nothing to do with people and if you look at for instance mark Mark chapter 15, verses 21 and following, it talks about a man named Cyrene, uh, a man named Simon mm -hmm. of Cyrene, who carried the cross for Jesus. Well, Cyrene is Libya, which is North Central Africa. So uh, how many times have you seen a photograph of Simon either carrying or working the cross with Jesus and he had black skin? Hardly ever, right? Uh, you look at mm -hmm. St. Augustine, when I was in seminary, one of the things that actually drove me to becoming a historian was I was doing a paper on St. Augustine and came to find out he was an African. He was not a white man. He wasn't European. He wasn't Latin. His mother was an African. And so it was those kinds of things that constantly help us perpetuate these evils because we're not taught by the individuals who should be teaching us properly because they have certain agendas. And then finally, our textbooks, especially from the early 1900s, to about 1970 were controlled by an organization called the United Daughters of the Confederacy that actually dictated what could be in a textbook and what could not. And, and primarily what they did was they dictated when uh, black voices could be uh, notified and when they were not. And for the most part, they wanted to make sure that the world was written and controlled and understood from a very, Euro a very European perspective. And so, uh, uh families with knowing all that, all of the efforts to make one of you inferior and the other superior, what, do you, what are the biggest misconceptions? I'd like to hear from all of you because people see mixed couples and they have their thoughts or not. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about the union between the two of you all? What has been the most troubling? I think I would say 
probably one of the most uh, troubling is from is the perception from other black people that it's wrong to marry somebody from a different race because I, my encounters with whites when they disapprove has been more uh I guess in in some ways more subtle in that what they choose to do is completely ignore you hmm. and discount you. Where my experience with blacks has been they are more apt to say something not to you, but within your hearing. Hmm. So that you know what their feelings are without them talking to you directly and you can't address them directly because they weren't talking directly to you. They were talking within your hearing. So the, the lack of understanding from anybody, from any race that doesn't understand that it's a personal choice. Okay, thank you, Hardy. Christy? Uh, that's, I think that's a hard one to answer because I, what I've seen um, most reaction to is our children, is how our children have to deal with um, other people's opinions of their parents. And of course our children had no say in that you know, um, but it's the world that they live in. So I think that's the hardest part for me is not, um, it's not anything I've gone through because of my choice. Um, or, um, yeah, I, I can, I can live with people's disagreeing with me in whatever shape they choose to exp is seeing how our children are treated because mm -hmm. of our choices. Natasha, are you prepared for that, for your two little girls? What are they, eight and five? Uh, six and nine. Six and nine. Oh, okay. Um, I was just having this conversation in a book club not too long ago. Uh, we're reading The Vanishing Plan. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but it's about two twin sisters, and one of them are fairly... Um, light skin and she passes off as being white and the other one is darker and so they end up splitting but you know this twin who is black she tries to pass off as being white and she does it but with my two girls you know sometimes I have to remind them that you know um you guys are you you're black and you're white and I think that you know society's gonna say and do whatever they want to do um, they're going to put you in the category that they want to put you in. But, you know, I just I'm trying to teach them that you don't have to choose. I don't want that to be a misconception. I don't think I've ever like. I don't think I have any reserves with it, but I just don't want them to feel like they have to choose a color mm -hmm. as they're growing. Mm -hmm. So, well, Christy, uh, what I, advice? I would agree. Oh, go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. I, I would agree. I would. I would honestly, um, this gives me a little bit of hope, honestly, for, for my generation and the ones behind it. We haven't experienced, and unless Natasha can remind me of something, I can only recall one incident ever in the, in the you know, 10 years we've been married and the 12 years we've been together, where somebody even said one thing that was a, it was an older gentleman in, a, in Savannah, Georgia, the restaurant. But other than that, we have never, ever had a instance in my opinion, where somebody said something, and we've been very blessed in that, honestly, uh, um, to not have any kind of friction or and any I, type of... And I think it's more because of their appearance. Because yeah. Taylor has a tan tone, but, you know, if I'm with Alex, or if Robert was with Alex, I mean, you would say she was white. But right. if Taylor was with me, you would probably think that she was mixed with um, a Spanish person. So I think it's I think it's more I think we don't have that problem is because of their skin color. 
So Hardy and uh, Christy, your children are older. And as Tasha is saying, she is not teaching her children. Do you have the experience that society will pick for them? Yes, because in school, the kids tell them either the white kids tell them, well, you're not really white. So, mm -hmm. you know, you really don't fit with us. And the black kids tell them you're not black enough. <laughs> so you really don't fit with us. Yeah. And that's been all of them have had that experience. Uh, I'm not sure Caleb has had it, had it as much as the others. He's he's only 11. He's the youngest. But I know how much Carson went through it. I know what, how much Joseph has gone through it. I know it, it's been, and this is at church, because uh, they attend my church at time, which is all black, and they attend the church that Christy goes to, which is predominantly white. And they have had experience, and in school with teachers even, I worked at the school that they were in elementary school at, and I saw how different the teachers, especially in the programs like, uh, what was it called? In some gifted schools it's called ACE, but the gifted programs, mm -hmm. the gifted programs was for whites, basically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for years I've seen kids, black kids that I know were extremely bright. And their teacher, their parents would be told, oh, they missed it by one point. They missed getting in it in the program by one point. They were just a little bit short. And I heard that from friends of mine for years also. When I, when Carson, my 19 year old, finally got in the program when he was in third or fourth grade. They said, wow, his IQ is going up so much. And it's just this and this and this. And I thought, you, you've lost your mind. And they have special trips that they take each year. So when I took him to the place to meet where they were leaving for the trip, 90% of the kids are white. The black kids were predominantly from predominantly black elementary schools. The mixed elementary schools, the kids were predominantly white. Mm. So yeah. the pro the, the Sorry. people over the programs, the teachers, the instructors over the programs, intentionally keep black and Spanish kids because I know Spanish kids at the school that I was at. I know how bright some of those kids were. As a matter of fact, one of them finished high school the same year that Carson did, she had a 34 on her ACT. You wow. can't tell me she was not bright enough to be in a gifted program. But she she went to Barker also. She was at the elementary school they were at. I knew her when she was at elementary school. She was never allowed to be. In all the years, I spent 13 years there. I only ever saw one Spanish kid in the program ever. And then the instructor put him out for something. I'm not even sure what it was. He was in there uh, briefly. Uh, so this is, is what they face in school even. So Tasha and Robert, as you listen to, and uh, Hardy, this is Albert's daughter. Tasha is Albert's Okay, daughter. okay. So hey there, <laughs> cousin. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I want to ask as you, I, the one go thing, ahead, um, Robert. The, uh, there's a little bit of a lag. I'm sorry. The the one thing that I would um, I would ask um, I I don't know the, the genders of the kids, but do you, do you think that um, society this might be a question for Dr. Stevenson too in historical platform? But do you th think that because um, our society as a whole has perpetuated uh, fear in, in the black male that because the, his sons kind of dealt with more of that um, than than, the, than our two girls have experienced or, or even in, in um, you know, even even uh, missed women uh, experience as a whole in our culture 
you think that has something to do with the way we perpetuated that that, that fear mongering of black men? Yeah, I think there's a there's a. I was I was just taking some notes here. Are you familiar with the Dow test? It Dow. was an it was it was, it was yeah. a test done right. by Kenneth and Mamie Clark back in the 1950s. Thurgood Marshall used okay. this test to argue against Brown versus Board of Education, which was an argument against Plessy Ferguson, which is separate but equal. Now, when the first mm-hmm. test was done in 19, I'm sorry, when the first test was done in 1952, they had, took a, a number of black kids, uh, and they gave them a black dial and a white dial, and they said, which dial do you like the best? 85% of the kids accepted the white dial. They did the test again about 20 years later, same exa- same response. 1998, same response. Uh, 2010, same response, right? And the argument was that racism is learned behavior and kids begin to learn it early in life. But another aspect of that is there are white kids who are asked the same questions. Which dial would you, which dial do your parents like? My parents like the white dial. Which which one is the bad dial? It's the black dial. Which is the dumb dial? It's the dark dial. And what happens is some of these white kids become teachers. Because in elementary school and junior high school, the majority of their teachers are white females. Yes. And so they grow up in an environment before they even realize it. Uh, being very sensitive to the fact that these kids are one, not like us, and two, that they don't fit into the program. And so that's why more black boys are sent to the principal's office, especially as they get older and begin, begin, more, begin to become more inquisitive because the assumption yes. is when you ask questions, you're being aggressive, right? Yep. Because black and brown people are not supposed to ask questions. So there's a whole system, a whole cycle that goes on that we're not even paying attention to, especially even when it comes to our young people. So you're right, JR. There is a sense in which even young kids, as they grow older in these environments, they are subconsciously placing black boys in these categories that have nothing to do with who the black boy is. It's just something that is a part of the social structure. And uh, there's a bo- another book you might want to read called Critical Race Theory. Um, by Del, uh, Delfano, uh, Stefano, and he argues, Stefano Delgado, he argues that racism is normal. It's not an aberration. And if we don't understand that, we're going to have a problem, right? That we have to recognize that racism is so woven into the fabric of our country that we do it and don't even re- we, we don't even realize we're doing it. That's why we have situations like, situations like microaggressions. You really are smart to be a black kid. Well, you sure are cute to be so mm-hmm. dark. Those kinds of things happen because the system is just a, a racism is so woven into who we are that we don't really know or realize that we're doing it. And for, we, I'm happy, Hardy, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm very happy to have this a couple that's been married for a number of years with older children, and then a younger couple, Tasha and Robert, who've been married uh, for 10 years so that we can compare uh, <clears throat> these perspectives. And thank you all to all of you who are watching Facebook and YouTube, uh, uh, Tarkin, um, Josette Jenkins, and Victoria Stevenson. Victoria says it's interesting to, she, as an adult child of a biracial couple, I love hearing different perspectives and experiences. And her mother is white and father uh, African-American. The, and as, just as the society will select for these children, sometimes the grandparents can react or other relatives can react in a way as well. One gentleman that worked for me, his, his, fa- his mother was white. He said, my father, my grandfather stopped playing with me when I was six. It was just done. Wow. And now I'm in my 30s and I don't have a relationship with my white grandfather because that was it. That was all that he had for me as a up and coming little black boy. Sure. Yeah. Wow. So, so do you think parents and, and Tasha, it's very wonderful and idealistic. 
how to, to feel and to want your girls to not be labeled? Are you prepared, Robert and Tasha, to coach them through that the world is going to label them? Yes. I am prepared because, um, you know, I took classes on it too during my master's program on how that they still, you know, this was just maybe six years ago. You know, I know you said that they were doing it back then. Um, if your dad was black, then you were black. And if your dad was white, then you were white. But it still happens. Today. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I'm prepared either way. Um, to sit down and talk with them. I told them every day anyway, because we have this conversation. We've been having it a lot lately since all the events have been happening in the news that, you know, I explained to them the things that happen um, to certain color of people that it doesn't happen to other. And, you know, they have their reserves and a lot of questions. And I'm, I'm here to answer them for them. I'm prepared. Uh, Christy, wow, as you I was going to highlight that. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Robert. I was going to highlight that question um, earlier. Um, do you think that the, if you look at, you know, our screen, um, you know, I'm obviously a Caucasian male and, and uh, Hardy's an African American male. Do you think that, that the male figure um, eases or makes the, you made it eases that, that burden a little bit on the family? Because, you know, again, society has pushed that the African American male, you know, with white woman is different than, you know, all of a sudden a white man can do what he wants with a black woman. It's, it's like a society by the tool historical thing i think that makes that, that also puts a burden on the children as well it goes back to tasha's comment of you know they they um they'll be labeled by the, usually the father the father's race um. do you well let me just read this comment from victoria she said that my grandfather on my mother's side said the only reason he approved of my parents marriage is because my dad is a christian and the Bible is very clear not to deny the fellowship of a believer, which is not um, that common because there are Christians who um, hang on to the fact that they're Christian and Jesus is white. So therefore, uh, we're not supposed to be uh, intermingling. Victoria, thank you very much for uh, sharing your perspective. So Victoria's father is black. And so I wonder, Victoria, did you grow up um, as a black girl or as a white girl? It'd be interesting to, to hear what she has to say. But for Christy, as you're listening, what were your thoughts early on with your children and how did that change over time or did it? Um, I think unfortunately I'm I'm not surprised at the response they get, but it has been very discouraging to see that even over the years, it, it doesn't appear to be getting any better for them. It, it's, it seems that in, inevitably they've all encountered people that are rather outspoken with their opinions. Um, and, and some of them will even be, um, well, just just blatantly rude. I think about our youngest being on a baseball team and one of his teammates who was a white male told him, you can't play baseball because you're black. You'll never be any good because you're black. <laughs> so encountering things like that, um, it, it, I, don't, I don't know how else to put it other than to say it's very discouraging. It's very disheartening that that they still have to deal with that. Um, so, so I think it's important to keep having those conversations with them. I want our children to be so well grounded in who they really are that they won't listen to somebody trying to tell them something different. Yeah. If I can just jump in, I, I really, I really hope and pray that you constantly invest. I, I have, I have several uh, master's degrees and two doctorate degrees, but when I was in elementary, junior high school, I had a counselor who told me I wasn't smart enough to go to college. Wow. It wasn't for my mother uh, buying me books when I was a kid and giving me opportunities to read and saying, hey, you know what? You can do this. Whatever you put your mind to, you can do it. You know, I probably would have lost my mind and, and not been what I am right now. And there are so many of us 
who have gone through the educational system in America where someone told them that your skin color makes you deficient. It has nothing to do with your intellect, right? And someone mentioned earlier about impression. There was a study done in New York City, in, uni, in New York University in the 1990s, and they argued in the study that we make 11 assessments within the first seven seconds of looking at somebody. And if, and if you are colorized, you know, no matter what that person, uh, who that person is, you've already been, you've already decided who they are based on what we call messagination, what your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents told you, and then what society and the media tells you. So we're constantly being bombarded with this negative information. And unless our parents and those who are closest to us are constantly informing us and affirming us, uh, it becomes very difficult to really become successful. Even when you do become successful, there can be various stresses. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joyce DeGroy and the post-traumatic slave syndrome, but you want, might want to read her work where she talks about the reason that so many black people have hypertension and stress is because at an early age, we're told stuff like that. You're not going to be good because of your skin color. And one has nothing to do with the other. It has to do with exposure, right, and access and affirmation. That's how we become successful. Robert, one of the things that you talked about was the um, um, free, free, how freely white men uh, were able to operate uh, in the community. And while, as I posted, while the laws did not allow for those relationships to happen, there were these babies that were being born as a result of those relationships. And the, as I was reading about this, and we, we say this word, mixed children sometimes are called mulattoes. You all have heard of that, right? Mm -hmm. It comes from the base word mule. Mm -hmm. They started calling black, the mixed babies mulattoes mm -hmm. because a mule can't procreate. Exactly. And even that name, we don't know that that's such a negative name. So if you're calling your children mulattoes, don't call them that anymore, because it's very negative, very, very negative, that they hung that label on these mixed children. It, it's not a compliment. Right. It's very it's negative. Hmm? Wow. Because it comes from a horse and a donkey. Right. Exactly. Wow. Never, exactly. I never knew that. Exactly. Yeah. But not only that, what's interesting about that is the mulattoes and those women, especially the women who were lighter complexion with the straighter hair, they often told soul for more. They were oftentimes house women and they were oftentimes used as wet nurses, right? Yeah. Because of their complexion, because they were quote beautiful. Even if you look at rap music nowadays and hip hop, they call these women who are light complexion with straight hair, they call them exotics, right? So, I mean, this, this, this race, racialized language is so fluid in the way that we communicate in the lexicon that we have, that we have to get past this white male heteronormative approach to what is successful and what cannot be successful. Our guest tonight, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Brown and Mr. and Mrs. Robert, uh, not Robert, Hardy Marshall, and I, I call him Connie. Um, they are obviously biracial couples. They have children. They are living in the United States of America. Uh, as many, many couples are today, as I mentioned, there are, there's still a percentage of the United States population that still believe that people should not be marrying each other. And I also, as, as I also was, it was interesting to learn that the Asian, there's a greater percentage of Asian women married to white men than any other group. Yep. But nothing, very little gets said about that. Yep. Um, it's just... Please, you Negroes and you white folks, can y'all just please stay on your side of the room? Are there times? Are there times that there there are things that you go through, or as you're looking at your children and what your children are going through because of who you loved? Are there times that you look at that and wish things were different? I think I always just wish things were different. Anyway, I think. Even if I had married someone black, I still would want things to be different for my children. So no matter, you know, if my children were all black or they're now biracial or whatever I would mix them with, whoever I would have fell in love with, I still would have wanted a better world for my children. Because if I were 
white and Robert were white, I still would want a better world for my children because there's a lot going on right now with society that's just not right. And I wouldn't want them to grow. I don't want them to grow up in a world where people are so hateful towards each other because of the way we look. Right. And I wish that growing up, like when I started working, I wish that my work experience had been based on my abilities and not on my race, because I know very well how much difference there was. And, and being here in the South, I guess, mm -hmm. is even more, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you experience even more mm -hmm. because uh, quickly, when I was at PNG and I'd only been there for about a year, the team I was on, they that's when they first started the affirmative action conversations. So they asked me to go around and interview as many black people as I could to find out how they, what they thought of the, the, the racial environment at PNG. And that's exactly what I did. When I came back, and reported to them what was being said, what I'd heard from people. I was I was reprimanded in <laughs> one of the worst ways possible. Mm -hmm. I was told, I was told that some of the promotions and opportunities I was going I had been set up for me. I was not going to get it. I was called a soapbox freak box preacher by my group manager. He called me into his office and I started, I, I tried to explain to him that I was just reporting on what I heard from the people. Right. And he, he, he shut me down before I could say a sentence and told me I needed to get off my soapbox. And this is when I was, I just turned 18 years old. Right. I had no, I was not outspoken by any means at that time. I had no, plans to try and change things. I was merely going back and reporting exactly what they asked me to get. And I felt the brunt of that for the rest of my career at PNG. I stayed for 30 years and those 31 years could have been very different if things had been different. Is that right? Oh my goodness. I'm not buying any more Pringles chips. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was such a shock to me. I was, I was flabbergasted because I did exactly what he said do. And then I came back and reported to him. I didn't talk to other people. I didn't tell other people what was being said even. Because he told me, just come back and tell me what you find. Right. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And he sent me straight to my group manager, which is two levels higher. And that was the response of my group manager. So Wow. That was an eye, that was very much eye opening for me. Yeah. At eighteen years old. Yes. And you were still brave enough to marry a white woman. <laughs> what was he thinking? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that was that I'm I'm telling you that they and I saw then we were when I started there, we were working a five day operation. We went to seven days, which was a lot of overtime. The plant had to go back, cut back on production. So they were going to go back to, uh, they were going to shut some of the lines down and run some of them seven. And some of the people would be put on five days, which is making less. All of the black people, 95% of the black people were put back on five days. The whites stayed on seven days, making the 25% more salary during that time period. Wow. That's crazy. As, 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 as we talk about these, these relationships that you all encounter. So Christy and Robert, are you all shocked sometimes when you, you now have this front row seat into African-American culture, the biases you get to see firsthand? Um, are you, do you have conversations with other white people that have to be enlightening for them? Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, absolutely shocked. Uh, I think, 
I think the thing that I learned though um, is is in this in this day and age now we've gotten to a point where the South uh, absolutely um, and when you say the South really really the six states between you know the Georgia Louisiana Mississippi Missouri that that area more so and into the west of that more so than where I was from in Florida, which is kind of a more of a melting pot area down where I grew up in Tampa. So like there was things that, you know, we all knew the race, the race issues. And we, we knew, we thought we knew, I should say, um, I've been become more enlightened um, in essences of like how deep it really is and how, how much systems are in place in certain areas and counties and government and different layers uh, and, and all the way into, into every layer of our society. Um, and I think that a lot of times um, you ignorance you, you don't know uh, and, and truly and there's people that truly truly do not know like they're not they're not trying to be naive they're not trying to play dumb there's folks that grew up you know in New York uh, in the cities of New York and didn't may have not have experienced the race that we're talking about in the South their race was different more economical or more uh, territorial whereas what we're talking about in the South was, was predominantly black versus white, like you said. And, um, and I think that that's something that I've also struggled with um, growing up, obviously, but also in the military, it's, you know, some of that is shielded from you. So yeah, definitely uh, for me. Were you shocked, Christy? It, it is shocking still to see how ignorant some people are today because they haven't been told or because of how they grew up or where they grew up, they, they were genuinely never exposed to the truth of how so many people in this country have had to live. And there is, there is, a, there is a lack of understanding that I see pretty widespread that people simply don't know. And, I, and unfortunately, I, I think some of it is willful ignorance, but a lot of it is not as well. And it's, right. it's a matter of not being educated on the truth. Right. Some people today simply don't understand how we got to today. Right. They don't have that basic understanding to understand, to, to follow the steps that have taken place over many, many years that bring us to where we are today. And we have such an opportunity in history classes, in even elementary school and all through grade school that could truly educate people to help them understand why we are where we are now. Yeah. But as has been pointed out, those that write the history books get to select what goes in, how it's phrased. Right. And it, it, it really is, it really is a, a, an ignorance on our part mm -hmm. of not knowing. And it's willful ignorance on the part of those that choose what to put in and what to leave out of the history being taught. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do have the hope and people were taught and understood the truth as to how we arrived at where we are today, they would have a different outlook on it. They would have a different opinion of things currently. They would have more compassion for those people who had so little to absolutely no control in what was done to them in the environment they were put in. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think education would go a long way toward helping us. In you this know, country, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Stevenson. You know, Chrissy, you make such a very important point. Um, I, and I talk about this in a couple of my classes. 1% of the American population have PhDs. Less than 3% of, of the world population have three PhDs. And yet over 97% of what you get out of high school and college is written by PhDs, which are predominantly white men. That's the first thing. But what's interesting here in, in, in Gainesville, uh, that it was just uh, made pretty much mandatory that African American studies be integrated into the K through 12 curriculum. I've even uh, given lectures at the middle school lecture at one of the schools here for student, for teachers who want to teach this material. I asked this is a middle pass test that oceanic space between West African and North, and North American, the Caribbean and Brazil. And I focus also on suicide by drowning as a form of resistance. So, um, so, but I was invited to give a couple presentations on how best to introduce this language. And I was shocked that even though many of these teachers want to teach the material, they didn't have the tools, right? Because the textbooks have been written from such a perspective that um, 
uh, they can only teach what they have. And so I, 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 there is encouragement that there are some school systems who are beginning to say, hey, we have to do this. But then you're right. There are some people who are willfully ignorant and it doesn't matter what you teach them. They're not going to change. But, yeah. but but if we can get to the younger generation, I, I talk to my students now who are in the in their early 20s. I have grandkids and great grandkids. I want to make sure that they have a world to live in where you don't see them as a threat. Right. And so I'm doing my best to make you a critical thinker uh, and engage in the community so that we don't continue to perpetuate this racist environment that we presently live in. And and where the skin, the the most exterior portion of the human is the determining factor of how one feels and, and, and thinks about another person. For each of you individually, the impressions that you have on um, how, Hardy, you mentioned how other black people may um, say things in your presence. Um, and Tasha, you, uh, in uh, your sorority, your sorority, I don't know that there are any white AKAs. Um, any comments for you when you told people that you and Robert were dating or going to get married? Excuse me, were there any comments? Any negative comments? Well, we were dating? Yeah, or when you told people that you were going to get married and... Um, if there were, no one ever said it to me. Okay. I don't know if Robert experienced any on his side of the family that he never told me about, but no one has, um, and I, I think, and to be honest, on my mom's side, Robert is probably the only, uh, one person over there. So no, no one's ever said anything negative to me about marrying him or dating him. Yeah. Is there anything that you all would like? And Victoria, Victoria said that she grew up as a biracial girl, uh, very clear that she, um, very clear of both sides. She was very clear of both sides of her family. I was one of 17 blacks in a private Christian high school and clear that many saw me as the cool kid, AKA the token black friend. I used it to my advantage. <laughs> VP of the parent student parent association student council you book staff cheerleading etc. I know my experience is unique, but I became strong a stronger person because of those experiences. And then she married an alpha and made it all good. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Did, um, have have you all talked to? Or, or what are your thoughts on who your children might select to marry? Or the rejection of those little girls if they are interested in a white boy and the white parents don't want them to marry your cute little adorable girls and both of you families have girls. Uh, I haven't thought about that much. Kids can't look at boys yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're forbidden. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I have, I have not. I'm just having given that um, in thought. I hope that, that uh, you know, I'd like to hope that we society would take leaps and bounds faster than it is. But I, you know, I guess that is a reality that at some point we have to address as well. And I'm well aware that that is something they are going to encounter. I don't wonder if they're going to encounter it. I know that they will encounter it. I don't know to what degree because it will very much depend on the people they have interactions with because some families, like our family, is more accepting. I know families that I'm, I have friends whose families would not be as accepting. So I know very well that they will encounter some of that depending on who they, especially if they choose to be with somebody else that's of another race. I know that they will encounter that. So 
after what you've gone through, Hardy, will you encourage them not to? No, I won't encourage them not to. Okay. I will not. Because relationships. There's, there's, there's no family. way. I don't think there's any way I would ever tell them not to be with the person they feel most for based on what race that person is or based on what they might go through choosing to be with that person. Because when it comes down to it, that would be just like my saying, okay, if I had a choice, what race would I be? And I'm going to be who I am. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot be who you are, then What's the point? what do you have? Yeah, right, right, right. right. Tasha, how, how will you guide that with your girls? They can't look at boys, I forgot. They're never going to look at them, Tasha. <laughs> They're your daughters. They won't ever look at boys, okay? Uh -huh. I was asking about your girls and boys, and and I said, they're your daughters, so surely they won't ever look at boys. You better have to Alex. <laughs> uh, the youngest one? Oh, you're freezing. Yeah. What were you yes. saying, Tasha? You froze there a little bit. Okay, I think you're having a little technical challenges there. Dr. Stevenson, you were about to say something? No, I, I was actually just laughing at what Hardy. Are you guys family? Yes, we are. Pam and I, yes. Pep, she's a marshal. I'm a marshal. We are the same marshal clan. Yes. <laughs> and it's a big, it is a big, strong <laughs> clan. My, and my, um, my daddy and his daddy are first cousins. Our grandfather yep. were brothers. Is that yep. right? And Tasha yep. is my third brother's daughter. Is that right? So where are you guys located? We're in Jackson, Tennessee. Okay. Which and is where we were, where our family grew up. This is where the Marshalls, one of the places, this is where the Marshalls, Pam's family, my, my dad's family, this is where they all grew up in Jackson. Okay. Actually, okay. Hardy, I, the Marshall family in Jackson, Madison County is the largest African American family in that county. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Really? You can't. You can't pretend to be surprised. <laughs> no, I did not know that. <laughs> there is no way I knew that because yeah. I know I know a lot of uh, I know a lot of uh, Bonds and let me see what are some of the familiar names Bonds. Uh, Martins, well, the Martins are in our family, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and half you? the Bonds are in our family. Wow. <laughs> and so, um, where are you? You are in South Carolina, Tasha, or North Carolina? We're in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay. Fayetteville, North Carolina. Right outside mm -hmm. of Raleigh. And Josette Jenkins Golett is also from the Marshall clan as well. Mm -hmm. Elma Marshall is her grandfather. She says we must, we first have to come to terms that there is only one race, the human race. Prayerfully yep. get to that point. And um, I, I do want to remind you all that Joe said is having a fashion show on Sunday at six o'clock. It is a live virtual fa fashion show. So I hope that you all will um, watch. Okay. And Donna Honeycutt, hey, I was raised in the North, segregation definitely existed by parents, my, my parents probably who were prejudiced. I tried to raise my children differently. Christy is my daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Donna, yep. Donna that's, the teacher? Was Mrs. Honeycutt? Do you know the Honeycutt? No, uh-uh. No, no. That different Honeycutt. Okay. That's a different kind of Honeycutt, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I am so proud of her. And I love and respect the Marshall family immensely. I pray for the education um, Christy spoke of. Thank you, Mom, for watching. You have a beautiful daughter. <laughs> we appreciate we appreciate you sharing her with us and Hardy and Tasha and Robert. I really, really appreciate you all sharing uh, an evening with us on the Timbuktu Report, where. Our goal is to educate and to inspire and to um, 
help lift people uh, to another level. Robert said, Aunt Pam, I had to jump off to a conference call for work at eight o'clock. I do understand that. And, and before we go for, for any of you, um, what piece of advice would you have for anybody who might be watching when they see you go by? Because you said, you know that you get looks. Um, what, what, what do you say to people who may look at you differently because of who you love and the beautiful children that you have brought into this world? Ladies. Christy, what do you say to those people? Um, I think I tend to leave the responses to Hardy. He would be the talker among us. <laughs> You've done quite so. well tonight, though, Christy. <laughs> uh, thank you. What, what I would say is, how is it you like to be looked at? And I'm no different than you are. I can assure you, I want the same things that you want. You want to be respected. You want to be looked at for who you are and what you stand for. And you don't want to be looked at only as a person of whatever color. That is not how you want to be looked at. So I want the exact same thing you want. And that's whomever I'm passing. Gotcha. Tasha? I kind of got... I kicked out in the middle of the question. Okay, okay. well, I'll, I'll repeat it for you, no problem. Um, when you and Robert are together and with your little baby girls, your little girls that are soon to be tweens or whatever they call those ages, what, what would you say to those people so that they will understand you are um, the wife, the mother, uh, the human, and you fell in love with somebody and that's who you married. What do you say to people to help them understand and to um, bring their judgment to a halt? Um, I've been teaching um, guidance in my guidance lesson all week, um, a story called Elmer. And it's about an elephant who um, is multicolored and he's different from all the other elephants and he does nothing but bring joy to all the elephants. And I've been teaching my students that, you know, our differences are what makes us so unique and it's what makes the world go round. And that's just it. We are all different. None of us are the same mm -hmm. in this world. None of us, I mean, we're not all the same color. We don't have the, all the same hairstyles. I tell them all the time, like we don't even live in the same home, but we all want to be treated like people. And we all want to be treated like equals. And so I would tell people, hey, you know, no matter who I fell in love with, I fell in love with them. And now we have these two children and they want to be respected and loved just like everyone else. Amen. Excellent. Amen. We're all well the same. We're all the same under the skin. And um Victoria says, I would say, don't criticize my steps until you've walked a mile in my shoes. Mm -hmm. And on uh, that note, I do really, really appreciate you all um, being vulnerable and sharing. And my prayer is that somebody who's listening heart uh, may be changed. I, I recall an evening that I spent in the home of a, of a white lady that I didn't know didn't want me to come to her home for her party. It was actually there in Jackson. Wow. It was uh, Mr. Deaton's mother, Deaton Carpet World. Right. And after uh, the party was on a Saturday night and she died the next day, but she mm. wrote in her journal, she grew up on a plantation um, farm in Alabama, I believe. And we talked about farming. But at the end of the evening, and I had no idea, she had said to Tony Texador that if you come to my party, you cannot bring her. And Tony said, if Pamela can't come, then I'm not coming. So when he called wow. me the next morning to tell me that she died, he said that she wrote in her diary, I had a great evening talking to Pamela Marshall. And now I realize all of these years, I have been wrong about the colors. 
Wow. In her final moments. Wow. Prayerfully, she had a chance to get it right because there is no segregated glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nope. will not say colored and white. Mm -hmm. And wow. all I can say to, to all of us is if we want to see our creator's face in peace, mm -hmm. and the scripture clearly says, how can you say you love me whom you've never seen, but you don't love your brothers and sisters that you see every day? Mm -hmm. Yep. And of all these things, mm -hmm. the scripture says, love is the greatest. Thy neighbor. Mm -hmm. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. Yep. So everybody, thank you so much. Continue to spread love. Continue to hug up on those babies. Dr. Rick Stevenson, thank you so much for your insight tonight. I really thank you. It. And uh, look forward to next week when we will be back here on the Timbuk2 Report. For our entire team at the Timbuk2 Report, we want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Remember, there is healing at the well. Make it a great moment. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.